It's a lovely day in August 2012. It's a great day to be here with my Hawaiian shirt and several friends. Okay, we just walked past the Church of the Oratoire. I'm going to tell that story in a minute. And we're down here in the Parc des Bastions. It's outside the city walls. Um, you can see the walls up here. There's one of the parapets that was sticking out so they could put artillery pieces on it. When artillery technology developed, the city walls of all of Europe's cities became obsolete, useless. So there, the space that had been out there, the fields of fire, was transformed either into large boulevards or parks all over Europe. In this case it was transformed into this beautiful park and then behind me new buildings were built for the University of Geneva. The University of Geneva actually began in the Auditoire where we were earlier because Calvin uh, taught there first but then in 1559 the University of Lausanne split, the academy split, and one of Calvin's lieutenants, de Bez, brought half of it here to Geneva, and they started training pastors not only in Lausanne but in Geneva. So, at that point, they, it became really the birthplace of the University of Geneva. They trained pastors in there for 200 years, and then moved to other buildings. But this is the place of the university now, and this is um, where Lenin would have studied in this library here. They actually have one of the library sign-in books where he's, he signed his name uh, in the library. Right opposite me is the Reformation Wall. This was the monument that was done to mark the 400th anniversary of the Geneva Reformation. So it's got the historic figures of that came out of that Reformation, not just from Switzerland, but the pilgrims who went to America, and it's got the text of the Mayflower Covenant up there, which all, all Americans have to study in primary school. It was the, really the beginnings of democracy in America, but it came out of the Puritan movement, which is, we know is totally influenced by Calvin and Geneva. And it's got other uh, Protestant leaders up there from other nations, and the, the texts of the, that came out of those nations that were really the foundations of government and thinking in those nations. And the four huge figures up there are Calvin, De Bez, um, Knox, and Farrell. And then you have the motto written large, Calvin's motto, Post Tenebris Lux, After the Darkness Light. Somewhere in the planning for this monument, someone decided rather late, hey, wait a minute, we can't completely leave off Luther and Zwingli. So Luther and Zwingli were added in as an obvious afterthought. They've each got a stone here, well away from the wall with their name on it. <laughs> it's funny. But let me tell you the story of that church where we walked by. It was the early 19th century, and as we mentioned, the, the church of Geneva was completely liberal. They did not believe in Jesus as the Son of God. They published a Bible that's like the Jehovah's Witness Bible today. They changed the references where it says Jesus is the Son of God. They changed those. They did not study the Bible. And a young Scotsman came for a visit. And they assigned a theolo theology student from Calvin's Academy to take him around town. And as he talked with this young man, he was appalled to realize that he knew nothing whatever about the New Testament. So he decided to stay, and he rented an apartment over by that square where we just passed, and he started holding Bible studies for the theology students. One of them wrote later, not only had we never studied the Book of Romans, most of us had never read the Book of Romans. <clears throat> so then, that was a new experience for them. Then they started to have another new experience, which was getting saved. They brought their professors and some of them got saved. And that began what we, what we call in French, we still call it today, the Revival. The Wesleyan Revival never made it to French Europe. My theory is that the enemy incited the French Revolution to keep the Wesleyan Revival out of France. The Revival, as we say in French, had a huge impact around here and across the French world. 
Many, many churches were started by the hundreds in France alone. Missions and movements were started. The first French missionaries went to the Pacific. They went to the Indian Ocean. They went to the Caribbean. All nations which had not had missionaries before because the French colonial governments had kept them out. But now a whole, a whole wave of missionaries was raised up. The problem with this revival, even though it was wonderful in the sense of many people got saved, there were very sound conversions, new churches were started, uh, orphan, orphanages and hospitals were started, but the, that revival never became a reformation. Let me just mention that there had been prayer for Geneva and for a revival for many years. And an English lady in Lausanne was a, prayed for years for a revival to break out. The Moravians were here, so they sent a team, and they were here for three generations praying for a move of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time, but it happened, and the spark was the visit of this young Scottish man who was willing to move to Geneva and do the Bible studies. There were two reasons that the nations were not taught that this that revival did not become Reformation. One was that the, the church had decided that teaching the nations was not the church's job. That reforming the government was not the church's job. That new laws were not the church's job. The church withdrew from all the spheres of society except teaching in the medical field. So up until very recently, it was not good for Christians to be involved in politics. Up until the 70s and 80s, Swiss Christians were told by their pastors not to vote because that was participating in the world system. And areas like the media were off limits to young Christians. Uh, business was permitted in certain circles. But as the church withdrew, of course, then that left more and more space for the enemy and the, his projects. This was the teaching of the Enlightenment that the church accepted that uh, we're trying to get back away from now. The other thing that happened is that a man came from England named John Nelson Darby, did a new translation of the Bible, which is very good, by the way. But he had a brand new teaching in the 1830s, and that is that Jesus was coming back any minute, and that we didn't have time to worry about going to university or learning to think or getting involved in, in government. Because Jesus was going to come back any minute, all we had time for was to, to get saved and to witness to our neighbors. And guess what? Jesus did not come back any minute. And uh, I have a wonderful seminar this week, and it's very small. One of the ways I keep my seminars small is by teaching on topics like Jesus is not coming back any minute. So let me be the one to tell you he's not. Let's not waste our time waiting. We need to get on with doing what he told us to do, which is teach the nations. And this, this teaching, which is uh, still very strong in certain circles, a lot of American circles, has been very, very um, harmful to the mission of the church. It's kept us in short-term thinking, and it's one of the main factors in the anti-intellectualism of the church. We have no idea how to worship God with our minds. We have never been taught that because we've never learned it from God. When the Lord said to YWAM, start a university, I knew right away he wasn't going to come back anytime. <laughs> because the university is a five generation project. And right now we're only in the middle of the second generation. There is one area in which the nations were taught out of that revival. This is going to be my last story. In that church that was started in the revival, it was full every Sunday with people from the upper classes of Geneva society. There was one lady who had a son. He was kind of a problem kid. Um, he'd be real spiritual one year and be a mess the next year. He, he spent a lot of time trying to get rich, so he traveled to North Africa to try to find mines, gold mines or whatever kind of mines, and then come back to his mother's church and try to get people to invest. He never made any money, died poor. But one time when he was coming back, he heard about a battle in a place called Solferino in Italy between the Austrian and French armies. He went out to the battlefield and it was covered with dying soldiers. And he tried to get the villagers to help. Uh, he tried to get the army to help. 
but they told them, no, if we, if we go out there, we can get shot. They'll just shoot at us. We try to help the wounded. So we're not going. So he came back to Geneva appalled that this kind of thing could happen. He wrote a, gave a report in his church and wrote a brochure, a little booklet called A Visit to Solferino, which is a call to the conscience of Europe. He basically said, as Christian nations, if we have to go to war, let's at least take care of the wounded, let's take care of prisoners of war, and let's protect the civilians in time of war. So from the Bible school that was next to the church where they trained the pastors, they sent two young men out to the next battlefield. And it was the first intentional mission to the wounded in human history. And the, of course the guy's name was Henri Dunant, and he started the organization that then became the International Red Cross. And that, those two young men went out in 1859. In the 1860s, the Red Cross called the nations of the world to Geneva. The 16 major world powers came and all agreed to sign a document called the Geneva Convention, which regulates the conduct of nations in time of war. Its principles are based on what God says about treating civilians in the prophet Amos, totally biblical principles. And now almost every nation on earth has signed the Geneva Convention, and they're taught in that area how to wage war. Now, of course, a lot of nations don't respect what they signed, but that's another problem. But here's the point. Every square meter of Europe has probably been a battlefield at one time or another. Christians have been looking at the wounded on those battlefields for 2,000 years. No one ever saw the wounded in the way that Ahi Dunant did until 1859. Why did he see and nobody else? I believe, and as I think about the people who saw differently in the history of the church, the Booths who saw East London for the first time, although Christians had been looking at East, East London for centuries, the poverty and the misery there. Hudson Taylor, he saw the inner, interior cities of China. Down through the history of the church, David Wilkerson and the gangs of New York City, people all of a sudden had their eyes opened by the Lord in a way that no one else had. Why these people? There's nothing special about most of them. As I said, Ahi Duna was a guy with problems his entire life. There's nothing extraordinary about David Wilkerson, even though he's a wonderful man of God. I believe the difference is in the heart. And God seeks the heart, and he sees when someone has a heart to do something about it. And when someone has a heart to do something, then he will open our eyes. Then he'll lead us to do the small, next small step of obedience. Then as we continue in that way, he'll multiply and ministries can start that can change the world. But they got to start with our hearts. I'm not just wanting to see new things because it's cool to see new things, but a willingness in the heart to lay down our lives and pay the price to change entire populations. Amen. <laughs>